you all for coming to our fancy fashion panel. Um, feminists have been pointing out since the 1970s that you know, gendered media images bombard women on a daily basis, right? And not only constitute idea, ideas about beauty, but disciplined behaviors and shape the ways in which we think about what it means to be feminine. And increasingly, women start to understand their own narcissism as a form of liberation, right? In other words, that women begin to turn to the consumer market to solve social and personal problems. And we see this emerge um, in the neoliberal era. But as our very own Minha Pham has recently pointed out in her blog, Threadbared, these representations are not, not only gendered, but they're also racialized, and they cre create the conditions of slow violence. Um, I'm, my work is on fashion blogs, as Sharon mentioned. Um, there's a lot to say about fashion blogs, and there's this kind of idea that fashion blogs are nothing more than the kind of this site where um, you know, young women, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, go to kind of flaunt their vanity, their wealth, their closets, right? And certainly that's one aspect of the fashion blog sphere. It's absolutely one aspect of it, right? But that view, um, I would argue, is a really narrow view and a really short-sighted view. I think that fashion blogs are reflective of and portend something much more interesting than this kind of place where people are just vain. What we're seeing with the rise of fashion blogs is not exactly a shift in the racial terrain of, of Western fashion labor, but what I think is a widening of that field of fashion labor, especially for Asians. Fashion blogs have created a global platform on which Asian bodies and labors are incredibly visible and also commanding. Susanna Lau, Rumi Neely, and, and um, Brian Yambao. All of these Asians have become influential authorities of fashion. Their bodies and styles of embodiment are highly recognizable and highly visible in global fashion publics, right? As well as being a driving force in fashion economies. So all of these things are great, except that hypervisibility, right, doesn't, digital hypervisibility doesn't actually guarantee material, uh, guarantee against material invisibility, right? Around May 2006, Fendi released these billboards, there were a couple of other ones, for its spring-summer 2006 ad campaign featuring Angela Linval. Dedicated Brian Boy readers noticed immediately that Linval was doing the Brian Boy pose, right? Um, there's the forward body bend at the waist, one hand on the hip, and the other is clutching a luxury handbag, in this case, the Louis Vuitton monogram, denim neo speedy satchel. Um, Brian Boy fans loved the pose so much that they quickly adopted it and ended up doing their own Brian Boy pose <laughs> and sending it to him. And of course, he solicited these pictures as well. Fendi's dodgy corporate practices render invisible Yambao's racially and sexually minoritized body. Linval, Linval and later um, Scarlett Johansson's bodies in the Fendi and Louis Vuitton ads reframe the racial particularity of the Brian Boy pose and Yambao's style of embodiment, in effect whitening the Brian Boy pose. Each of these ads had a white female model doing the Brian Boy pose. Fendi's unauthorized use of Yambao's pose is part and parcel, of course, of fashion's long history of misappropriations of minority cultural forms and practices. In a reversal of the popular fashion discourse of authenticity in which the people and place of Asia are frequently imagined as the site of fake design and recently um, fake luxury consumers, um, Europe and, 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 Europe and Europe, um, European America are imagined as the site of the true art of design, Yambao proclaims himself the original creator of the pose. Nothing can beat the original, the legendary, and the infamous Brian Pose, he says in another blog post. His strategic branding of the pose as the Brian Boy pose enables his mobility across the racially class division between the artist and the labor, or manual labor and creative labor. And as a consequence, this Manila-based blogger redefines where fashion and value are located. And I'm gonna stop there. Thanks. In which what I was primarily interested in was this question of value. Um, the fashion modeling market has extreme variance in prices of models. Some models make uh, huge amounts of money, and then many models, as we'll see, don't make very much money at all. And so what I was interested in is trying to figure out where does the value come from, how does it get decided, um, how does something like beauty get stabilized into um, an economic good and then trade it for price. And so this is what fashion modeling uh, or fashion scouting in Siberia looks like. Uh, so 
basically the castings are held in places like community halls or local gyms um, or in nightclubs sometimes in the daytime. Uh, girls will turn up by the dozens, they change into their bathing suits and their high heels. Uh, they are asked to walk, to pose, to talk to a panel of uh, scouts. Um, the potential ones get photographed, they get uh, videotaped. And then those images then get sent to these agencies around the world, a kind of, kind of global network of agencies around the world who are hiring the scouts to kind of do their groundwork of, of finding potential fresh faces. So the fashion modeling industry worldwide has seen a huge increase in model scouting. Um, since the 1990s, we have the proliferation of the internet, um, the kind of ease of travel, um, the, the opening up of communication, the opening up, importantly, of the post-Soviet bloc in the 1990s, um, which in a sense becomes uh, a, a major scouting ground, a kind of feeding ground for uh, agencies um, uh, in so-called fashion cities around the, around the world. So girls get scouted from these developing or, or somewhat uh, poor or peripheral parts of, uh, of uh, white countries, and they get shipped off to emerging fashion markets, places like Hong Kong, Tokyo, Singapore, or a proliferation of emerging fashion markets outside of places like Hong Kong, like Guangzhou and Shenzhen. And these kinds of uh, markets are largely known as cash cows to modeling agencies. They can send their models into a place like uh, Tokyo or Hong Kong. Nobody in Paris will see it, um, so you know it doesn't carry this kind of uh, lower status of, of not, not working in Paris, um, but the money is really good and the cat catalogs pay well. Well, there are two ways to understand this kind of uh, proliferation of scouting in poor white parts of the world. Well, first we can think of it as a case of um, uh, maybe what we might think of a kind of neo-colonial imposition of Western cultural values shaping a kind of homogenized global beauty which uh, people like the photographer Zed Nelson has been documenting around his travels, what he sees as a kind of increasing homogenization of a standardized sort of look. So, uh, so bodies and faces increasingly growing more and more similar, uh, billboards increasingly looking the same around uh, different parts of the world. Maybe global beauty is becoming homogenized, maybe this is a reflection of kind of uh, mass media imperialization, <coughs> the soft power of the West. Um, so, um, I want to read from a work in progress um, on the hooded sweatshirt, uh, sartorial racial profiling, the violence of uh, preemption, and the value of black life. In the aftermath of the shooting death of the 17-year-old Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida, I'm struck by how discourses about race and racism are both dodged and also magnified by the presence of the hoodie as a sign, a screen, an expectation, and a force. We might conceive of the hoodie as the excess assigned to the black body, the black body that is excessively material, criminal, and deviant after um, uh, black theorist uh, Denise Da Silva, who writes, quote, I am interested in racial violence as a figuring of excess, which is what justifies otherwise unacceptable occurrences, such as police or vigilantes in this instance, shooting unarmed persons. The hoodie does not hide a history of racial violence, but is central to it. Um, so I just want to uh, end uh, these br uh, very brief comments um, with some thoughts on these posed hoodie photographs that I'm uh, scrolling through here, which proliferated in the aftermath of Martin's murder. Uh, the first observation uh, I want to note is their proliferation circulation on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, etc., and what this might tell us about new communicative strategies of movements for justice. The second observation is a question about how these photographs mediate articulate and otherwise index the lived relations of black life in an increasingly militarized culture of uh, profiling and preemption. The hoodie is not inert, uh, passive, or otherwise lifeless in these photographs. In their multiplicity, a million hoodies might echo a call to move towards a collective confrontation with state-sanctioned violence and its agents with those forces that would curtail and cut short black life. short talk with this gif that was circulating a few months ago. I'm sure most of you saw it. Um, people were posting it to their Facebook. It was on HuffPost. It was uh, on Jezebel. I mean, everyone was talking about it primarily because it was really the symbol of 
Korean plastic surgery, the phenomenon that is Korean plastic surgery, and really uh, is an, a symbol of the ways in which uh, discourses in the US talk about uh, Korean plastic surgery. Right? Um, and it becomes this sort of freakish spectacle of transformation devoid of any humanity and sort of crossing these lines of morality, right? What is proper to do with our bodies? And, um, you know, that they're, they've succumbed to this sort of internalized patriarchy and, and racism. Um, so that's, you know, the discourse we hear all the time. It's been everywhere in social media. My next example is an SNL Korea digital short um, that the Brown Eyed Girls, who is a K-pop group, made. And this uh, video is the Brown Eyed Girls singing a song called Plastic Face set to the, the song Poker Face. Um, and in it, they're really sort of taking on the gender contradiction wherein men in South Korea often criticize women for being plastic monsters, but at the same time are um, consuming, right, these sexualized and gendered bodies, right? And so they're really sort of taking this head on and parodying um, this contradiction, but also, again, sort of pointing to the industries that are making plastic surgery a viable, um, a viable option of self-management. And just to quote some of the song, um, but nose, eye, and mouth jobs are so cheap with the money for a brand name bag, you can get a new face. If you get them all done as a set, you can get a discount. If you get them done with your friends at the same time, you can get even more of a discount, right? So first of all, I mean, as pop stars, to be really owning the fact that, that they've had surgery, and I, at some point in the video, they even show an old pre-surgery photo of themselves, right? Which is, you know, the, the audience, you can hear them sort of gasping and cheering at the same time. So the problem, though, with this sort of parody, right, and Gangnam Style is obviously they're still part and parcel of the industries that um, create the conditions under which this consumption is happening, right? So even though they are changing the conversation um, and maybe in some ways speaking back, they're still um, perhaps in some ways anticipating those critiques and absorbing them. And in some ways, even though it's a parody, even though it's pointing out some of the contradictions, also in many ways can be read as just another advertisement for the plastic surgery ind industry vis-a-vis uh, Korean pop culture.